Um, we're going to uh, get started now on a uh, quite uh, distinct topic. Um, uh, that is, uh, we're going to be talking about uh, discrete event modeling. This is lecture 22 for those interested in following along. And I would like to encourage, uh, encourage those to follow along as, as some of these slides uh, will be uh, will be helpful for, for sort of musing after I move on because in this, as for the previous lecture, I'll have to go pretty fast. So um, uh, any logic has, has rich support what, for what's sometimes called network modeling or irregular spatial, which involves irregular spatial embedding. Um, I'd like you to, to open up a model called the ophthalmology department. Um, and uh, this, this model, let me just, uh, uh, okay, sorry. Uh, let's let's make sure it's it's still present in any logic. Sorry, I, it, it may be that it's it's been deprecated. Um, so so let me. Um, so if we can't do that, we may have to uh, uh, to, to just bear with uh, going through the slides uh, for now. I'll see if I can make it available to you separately. Um, so uh, for those who who's any logic, I apologize. I apparently closed my down by accident. Uh, for those whose uh, any logic is still up, do you see a uh, uh, ophthalmology department or no? You see an emergency department? Okay, but not. How about go to uh, how to models? Okay, emergency. But how about ophthalmology? Okay. Uh, okay. Pardon me. I, I should have planned this. Uh. Oh, here it is. There it is. Um, so, folks, go go to the um, help menu, um, uh, example models, and you'll see it right here. Ophthalmology department. Uh, just uh, four up from the AnyLogic fac, AnyLogic tutorials. See that. Okay, so, so you oh, you know what? Oh man, they, okay. There used to be actually a model provided. Um, uh, gosh. Um, okay, I may, I may have to. Uh, yeah, uh, Jeff. Oh, and oh, okay. Um, uh, ophthalmology department. Okay. Um, sure. If, if if there's one there, that would be great. So, an example models for sharing in class only. Okay. Okay. So so open that one then. Okay. A M drive. Yep. Okay. Example models um, for sharing in class only within class only, and then. Um, Ophthalmology department, any logic six two two two. Okay. Um, yeah. Um, okay. So um, let's uh, let's first of all run this. Um, let's let's run this model just so you, you can get a sense. I'd like you to run main phase three. You'll see. Oh, sorry. I'd like you to run simulation here. Okay. Um, and. What you should see is something along these lines. Um, oh, gosh. Oh, gosh. I left that in. I'm sorry. Um, that's, supposed to be, that's supposed to be a doctor, not a jet, fighter jet. Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> so, sorry. Um, so, uh, that, was, that was a result of the uh, MIT class experimentation. Um, OK, so um, here we have people presenting for care coming in here, and uh, they're cared for by the US Air Force. Um, <laughs> so so there's, there's doctors up here um, awaiting patients. And when the doctor goes to treat a patient, they transform into a fighter jet um, and move at high rates of speed to the patient. And then, then they escort the patient down to waiting rooms, which are reserved specifically for that patient. 
they they administered care in a way that only a fighter jet can, <laughs> and uh, and then the, the patient is freed and, and they um, they they leave and the doctor uh, goes back to the room where they transform um, into Clark Kent and, and and have a white coat once again. Um, so. Uh, we're going to talk about how a model like this is realized um, uh, and um, talk about how it can be generalized uh, to, to much more sophisticated scenarios yet, just a little bit in terms of, um, in terms of uh, things like operation of an entire hospital. Um, this emergency department model is even more evocative. Uh, uh, you don't have fighter jets for doctors, but what you do see is a real life process of people um, uh, rep uh, presenting for care, meeting a triage nurse, being routed to various rooms with various types of diagnostic equipment, including VCUs and, and X-rays, CAT scans, being um, treated by doctors, being escorted by various types of nurses, um, and, and treated with various types of technicians, and um, and then finally uh, leaving the hospital um, with escort um, to a point. So. So th that's an even more uh, sophisticated one. But we're going to be talking about how this modeling is built up. And I'm going to have to combine my comments to, to, with great brevity here. Um, what we're dealing with here is sort of a, a resource-based type of modeling, um, uh, process-centric, where front and center is, is sort of a set of processes that operate on patients. Um, and um, those processes are governed by, um, in terms of their operation, who they can operate on, how frequently, et cetera, by a variety of, of, of constraints. Um, people flow through processes. Um, there's queues uh, awaiting processes where, where resources are not yet available. Um, and uh, there's, there's uh, resource pools, such as for doctors, nurses, rooms uh, within the hospital, the piece of diagnostic equipment. Um, and fundamentally, we have these entities flowing through the system. Um, here, these entities are patients, uh, and it's kind of a more of a passive model than you typically see within agent-based modeling, in the sense that they flow through and they're operated upon by various processes. These flow charts that we've seen um, uh, essentially specify. So, if, if you double-click on main phase three, you'll see something that you're not used to seeing in a main class. You'll see a flow chart. And this flowchart articulates, it specifies the set of processes that operate on patients. Flowcharts can be quite complex, so they can involve branching, um, entities going in two directions in parallel so someone can get a manicure and a pedicure at the same time, and, um, and throw the flow through the system um, along multiple ways and, and rejoin. Um, you can also have them be hierarchically defined so that uh, you can, uh, excuse me, um, you can have, for example, sub subunits that are sort of modularly specified for for VQ scans or, or ultrasound scans or CAT scans, um, dealing with with various uh, processes associated with administered uh, by by various um, healthcare workers, etc. Um, and these flowcharts specify this process. And any logic has a quite detailed language that that you build out of which you build these flowcharts. Resources are required for processing at different points within these flowcharts. So if you're awaiting the care of a doctor, that doctor will need to be freed up to, to deal with you um, before you can be processed. Um, they may currently have a queue of other patients awaiting them, and you'll have to wait for that, that queue to be freed up for the doctor to, be, uh, to go to you in particular, so you get in that queue. Um, entities interact with resources. They may so-called seize a resource. So they may seize a resource like a, re a room within the hospital, seize a resource such as a piece of diagnostic equipment, and even seize, um, uh, it may sound transgressive, but uh, it's not, but they may seize a doctor or they may seize a nurse. Um, and so that nurse is then associated with them, the doctor's associated with them. They can further attach and detach, so they, they will travel with pieces of, do of mobile equipment or with a doctor or a nurse. And there's homes for various types of resources to whence they return. Um, and people will move over polylines. Now, it turns out agents can move over polylines, too, just we, like we had moved to yesterday. You can move along polylines, although we didn't have time to talk about it. Um, so um, to do this, we have to specify a network. And a network groups together logically the entities, the resources, and portions of the workflow. 
Okay, so let's go. Let's go take a look at our model. And um, if we're, uh, I'd like you to click on. Well, if you click on main phase two, you'll see something like this, where you'll see there's a, a, a more abbreviated process, and then there's a network here that links together resources here, um, doctors, uh, procedure rooms, and scopes. And you'll notice that one of the first things patients do when they enter the, the areas is they enter that network. They're associated with that network. You might, in the course of a given flow chart, have many different networks that a patient contacts as they move from ward to ward, for example. So a given patient might be flowing at, and through a set of processes that operate in one ward, and then they're routed to another ward and, and go through a different network with different resources associated with it. So a, a network logically groups together a set of resources. And each of those resources is associated with a, a pool that's normally treated as interchangeable. So a pool of doctors, a pool which might represent hospitalists, a pool of procedure rooms, and a, and a pool of scopes in this case. So entities are the central parties on which the processes take place, and they're predominantly passive. They flow through these, these flow charts. They're, as we say, injected into the system at a source, and they disappear at a sink. Here's the sink here. Here's the source from whence they, ar they arrive. Um, multiple entities are typically in the system at once, so you'll have multiple um, individuals presenting for care and, um, and under care by fighter jets. Uh, if we wish to maintain extra information on an entity, we can subclass the, the entity class. And for those seeking to know what that means, we'll be touching on that some, um, uh, sub touching on that some this afternoon in the Java tutorials. Um, but basically, you can create a, a, a variant of that entity, a specialized version of the entity that maintains extra information. Perhaps it's statistics on their flow. Perhaps it's their history of treatment. Perhaps it's the agent with which they're associated. Yes, Dylan? It, uh, ophthalmology. Um, and, and you find it example models for sharing in class only. Ophthalmology example 622. Yeah, it's on the M Yeah. Um, yeah. Different skill set at different pools, but the point is they're 
more or less kind of almost anonymous um, interchangeable units and interact with patients through these through these procedures. There's, um, I, I think it may be accurate to say there's traditionally less exchange of information and there's less, you know, it would be hard in this framework to have agents, in this framework alone, it would be very hard to have agents infect each other, for example, while waiting in the waiting room. Hard, hard to have agents infect a given doctor, um, et cetera. Now, with extensions to this framework, by you could have doctors extend it so they record additional information. And what we have in a, in a separate lecture is doctor, this hybridized with agent based modeling. So when they leave, they were, the agents still exist and then come back and present for care again. They remember their history, for example, or or they have a certain status, which is either cured or not during this this flow. If it's not cured, they'll come back, you know, again. Um, and doctors might be individually paired with patients based on patient history. If you saw that patient before, you're more likely to pair with them again for the long run. But so that's really sort of a hybridization. Jeff, do you want to comment on this question on on how does this differ, sort of, um, conceptually and philosophically from um, from agent-based modeling? Agency. Appreciate that, and um, just just like with system dynamics and agent-based modeling, um, you know, there, there's hybrids, and and also you can kind of, as I mentioned earlier, you can kind of twist one framework to kind of approach the other. And I, from my perspective, and, and this is my perspective as a computational scientist, there's um, you use these things as tools, and you don't become a slave to the tool. Um, you you choose what specification mechanism is most natural for expressing, for characterizing, for specifying your particular problem, and you mix and match them, or different sub areas of your problem, and you mix and match them um, in a pragmatic way, and um, and so you kind of get a feel for where the natural cleavage lines are. For example, Yuan's model yesterday that she presented has a process of contact tracing represented in it. And I would say if that were a bit more complicated, I'd be tempted to put it into a hybrid with a discrete event model. Because then you could have, you know, healthcare workers being resources secured by a patient required to, you know, the, there's a, a public health nurse that's required to perform the contact tracing. And if she's caught up with, with uh, related to a different issue, she can't be doing the contact tracing and patient. And these TB, um, cases would flow through the system, QB contacts would flow through a system, and you could map it out quite nicely, more naturally than you would in, a, in an agent-based model in any logic by <coughs> itself. And I think one of any logic's great strength is, again, you could use each different area of modeling to capture different sub-pieces of the same model. So those things that are process-centric, you, you could do with this. Those things that involve agents in a rich way, interacting with their environments, making decisions, with agency and and and, and uh, you know uh, shaping shaping their evolution, that would be more agent based and continuous processes, whether within an agent or at the global level, etc., could be 
captured very, very succinctly, crisply, transparently using system dynamics, and you can weave them together. Okay. Um, and by the way, I have an example model uh, in your examples, which is a hybrid agent-based in this type of modeling. And it's a very stylized model, but it shows how, to, how you weave them together. Okay. Um, okay. So agents are largely passive, flow through, and um, uh, excuse me, uh, entities and. Um, they're uh, associated with a physical representation which travels around a, a visual environment. Resources are required to initiate, are commonly required to initiate uh, particular phases of processing. So for example, a doctor might be required to administer surgery, a piece of diagnostic equipment to image a patient, et cetera. And we distinguish resources along a couple lines. Are they portable or are they fixed? Or finally, are they mobile? Do they have agency themselves? Can they travel around? Um, in an active way, or are they merely portable, like a scope? They can be pushed around, but they need someone to, to push it. They themselves don't travel. Um, or are they fixed, like a, a piece of, um, of, of uh, an x-ray machine, um, a, a fixed x-ray machine, or a CAT scan machine. To capture these dependencies, the network is associated commonly with multiple types of resources. So, you know, I have a, I have a lot of slides here, and we have little time. Um, so uh, I'll just say that if, if you're in uh, main phase two there, or main phase three for that matter, you could select one of these resource pools and you'll find that you can specify the capacity of the pool and whether it's static, moving, or portable. Okay, um, Moving being that one sort of more agency. Let's talk about this flow diagram. There's a start and there's a finish, a source and sync. The, the entities disappear traditionally totally going out of existence it, from the sync. Um, just as Jeff was indicating, normally these entities are these kind of anonymous things that flow through, um, and uh, you know these pebbles of sand, and you don't really care if it's the same pebble you saw yesterday. They just kind of flow through, and um, here they disappear entirely, so memory is forgotten. Um, uh, again, one of the attractions for for hybridizing it. Um, but they appear and they disappear, and they appear with a certain rate, or when you call inject on this, or um, th there's some, some choices there. Um, and then there's some intermediate steps, and the icon here indicates, using any logic sort of graphical language, as it were, um, the, the, t the semantic kind of that sort of event. So something that looks like this is a network enter, something like this is a network sees, something like this is a network attach. Network sees associate someone logically with a resource network attach, associates them physically so they could travel together. Flowcharts, as I said, are hierarchical and have branches and joins. Um, uh, an agent can be routed one way or the other, or in a ghostly sort of way, they can go two ways at once. So again, the pedicure and the manicure at once. Or you can be inspected by a cardiologist while people are, are um, trying to deal with you know, lacerations on your foot or something like that. Um, uh, uh, now there's a set of palette uh, elements over in the enterprise, at least in er, uh, earlier versions of AnyLogic, it was in an enterprise um, area of the state chart. You may have to click on palettes and do, um, oh, oh, enterprise library. OK, there we go. Um, um, enterprise library, uh, here we go. Down, down at the bottom, the enterprise library, and as you can see, that's quite a um, uh, quite a library um, in terms of its um, extensiveness. Um, so let's talk about these operators, and I'm going to have to go really quick, and I apologize, but again, you can find detailed discussion of this through my other lectures. So sources and sinks um, uh, organization, and, and you can specify a rate, inter arrival time a rate table, arrival table, or you can specify it manually. And notice it says that the entity is created. This new entity creates an entity object. Okay, That's how in Java you create a new object. Um, and so when this person comes in, it calls new entity. This is an anonymous entity. There's no information maintained on who it is, no recollection that this is the same person who was here three days ago. Sinks destroy entities, and um, they uh, they can trigger actions. So um, uh, actions can be triggered. You notice this is an action for new entity for source and on exit. And, um, and then there's an on enter action for syncs that you know, it could print out a message or do something, record something to the database. 
Okay. More, more functionally, um, there's a thing called network ent enter, and that associates this entity with a certain network. And again, a, a given flow chart like this can have many different network enters for different circumstances. So you go to, you're routed to this ward or that ward, you leave the emergency room and you go to the critical care unit or what have you. Um, and network enter is associated with, associating you visually with a, a network. Um, and you have a certain speed within that network. Um, and then there's a network exit that's paired with that where you leave that network. Okay, and again, there's hooks. This on enter is, is, is a handler that you can specify a bit of code when that occurs. And this on, on enter for network exit is also a, a handler. Okay, so that was network enter and exit. When you enter that network, you are then subjected it knows about all the resources available for the network. Um, it knows about the paths associated with that network um, through which you can travel. Um, and, um, and essentially you're sort of logically associated with, with those sort of things. You can interact with those resources. Okay, um, let's talk about uh, operators of interest. So one operator is this split path. Um, so select output. Um, and um, there you can go either one way or another. So for example, in this case, this is from a different model, it's asking, is an x-ray needed for this patient? And, um, and, it, and you can choose it if a certain condition is true or with a specified probability, okay? So um, we could have, in principle, in a hybrid model, we could have a branch here, if this was an if this entity is associated with an agent who visited this hospital before, we'll route them this way because they're a known quantity. We have their information. Or, you know, if they're a someone from our province, we take their HSN card. Otherwise, we go through a process to, to, to just look up their HSN code from another province or what have you. Um, so that's a, that's a um, select output. Um, another operator is quite simple is the delay. So it's just associated with the procedure. And you can either give a delay time that's specified explicitly or say there's a pa path length associated with it over which they have to pr traverse. So maybe um, you have to go through a long tunnel from one ward to another and you want a delay associated with that to be captured. Um, this can be without drawing it out or what have you. This can be specified explicitly. What's this uniform thing? Where have we seen that before? Where have we seen that in agent-based modeling? Uniform. What is that? That's a draw from a uniform distribution, continuous uniform, between 0 and 10. Mm. So remember, this is all in any logic. This is all the same basic framework in terms of a lot of the, the methods you're calling, et cetera. Um, and you notice it says a, a, a capacity of 5. So basically, 5 people can um, it can be associated with, with, uh, with. I believe it's waiting in line for this procedure at once, but maybe actually, um, well, undergoing this procedure at once. It may be, may be the more accurate way, but I, I'd have to double check my memory of that. Let's talk about resources. Frequently, resources are required to initiate a particular phase of processing. Um, yes, I believe that's. They can be undergoing it at, at one time. Resources are required to initiate a particular phase of, of processing as we required. So um, we might need, in order to undergo that procedure, we might need to have a resource associated with us like a doctor who can, who can perform the procedure. Um, when an agent can't obtain or seize a resource, they in queue and wait for that resource. And these resources live in, in these interchangeable pools of resource units. So hospitalist pool or an RN pool or what have you. A seized resource comes from the pool and a released resource goes back to that pool. If we wish to distinguish resources, we create different pools, much as if we wish to distinguish someone in an aggregate model, say uh, men and women who are infective uh, with gonorrhea, we would put them in separate, um, separate uh, stocks. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so how do we seize resources? Well, there's a thing called network seize. And there's a thing called network release that release it. Network sees attempts to achieve logical association between an entity who's there and a particular resource of a specific type. And then release releases that association. 
Um, and again, these are the resources associated. So it's seizing a resource within the network which it entered, and, and those resources are defined associated with the network. Okay. Um, so uh, let's uh, let, let's talk about um, that. Maybe maybe we'll just glance at the model here. So here's a network C's. So this is in main phase three. So see with our model, and if we click on network C's, we'll see that see that this is seizing three resources. It's seizing a proc room, a doctor, and a scope. Okay. So in the patient flows here, they attempt to to seize each of these resources, um, and uh, I, I may have comments later on what happens if you could seize one but not the other, et cetera. Um, I believe you take what you can and you're going to wait for the others, but I'd have to check. Um, in any case, um, let, let's, um, let's talk about the major flow operators, though, because there's going to be some conceptual distinctions that are important here. One is seize and release, seize and releasing, which is basically uh, creating and breaking logical um, logical association between an entity on the one hand and a resource or one or more resources on the other. Um, for non-static resources, resources that could travel around that are either mobile, they can move like a dock or an RN, or they're portable like a, um, a portable scope or a, a portable x-ray, you can use what's called network attach. And what that means is when the patient moves with that resource, it, it will t take, it'll, it, that resource will be brought along with that patient, okay? Again, entities are very different here than the resources. So a doc here is not just an entity. They're a, you know, with an agent-based model, they'd be another type of agent, right? You'd have a doc agent, you'd have a patient agent. Here, they're different sorts of things. And in a way, they're their own solitudes. They, there's a, there's a, a doc who's a resource and about resources, they're part of an interchangeable pool, and, and patients are these entities that flow through passively. Docs are sort of awaiting um, needs of patients and are there to allow for certain treatments to take place, but um, they're not flowing through the system. So it's kind of this different status that's associated with it. There's further for moving entities, entities which can move themselves, docs, RNs, et cetera, there's a network move to. And, um, and for w when someone moves mobile res resources to a location, you could use network send, um, send to, okay? Um, we'll, talk about, uh, we'll talk about that in a bit. Okay, um, so a key distinction here is between seizing and releasing a resource, which really asks, is it associated with this entity? That is, is it, is it reserved by this entity? And attaching, detaching it, will it spatially follow? Will it move with the entity, okay? Um, so, um, so here we saw network C's associated with certain resource pools. Um, by the way, um, for someone who has Java background, uh, uh, Dylan, do you recognize what this is here? Do you recognize what this thing is here? Yeah, it's an array, yeah, exactly. So those curly brackets are used here because you could specify the contents of an array using curly brackets. Um, um, and so that's just a sort of aspect of, of the Java base um, poking, rearing its ugly head. Um, okay, so what this does is it seizes one resource unit from each pool. One resource may be seized while waiting for the others, okay? Network release dissociates themselves. So let's go to network release in this thing network uh, release, uh, excuse me, um, yeah, there's a network release. It's under listed under release there. Um, so they give it a, a name that's a little bit different than its type, which is network release. And notice it says release all seized resources and moving resources return to their home location. So when the patient um, reaches this point, the fighter jet returns to its home location, right? Um, and the scope is actually brought by the fighter jet home. Um, uh, okay, let's talk about uh, network send to. Um, uh, so network send to, there's a thing called send to storage here, okay? And what this sends is it sends a mobile resource, a doctor, to, to the location of a seized unit, the scope. So the scope as a resource lives in a certain location, and um, 
and uh, he's uh, going in the form of a fighter jet to retrieve that that location. Um, okay, so um, here, here we go. Um, so so let's slow this down a little bit because those fighter jets move awful fast. Um, so so maybe we're gonna have to. Oh man. Um, uh, well, here let's let's go change the, the speed with which those fighter jets approach their target. Um, so uh, let's go down to doctor. Let's go down to the doctor resource, mm -hmm. and you'll notice that um, the doctor resource um, is defined here, and it's given a um, an idle unit uh, animation shape and a busy shape. So the busy shape is fighter. Um, and the idle shape is shape doctor. Okay, um, uh, let's let's just give them a different shape. Um, imagine how expensive our hospitals would be if every doctor were a fighter jet. <laughs> yeah. Do you see some fighter jets in Mayo from time to time? <laughs> I feared as much. Um, okay. So, so um, uh, let's go down to presentation. Um, and uh, excuse me, um, there's actually, I, I think there's in, um, uh, yeah, so go down to in palettes, there's a thing called pictures, okay, and in there if you go to pictures, there's, there's more sedate um, versions of, of, of doctors. Now, you folks can just determine how you want to represent a doctor in your model. I would note that um, there's uh, fork lift trucks and um, lorries and um, ships, um, but let's, let's drag in a uh, doctor, um, a doctor sort of uh, representation here, and it's called Doctor One, and then let's, let's uh, in the main phase three, let's add for doctor that they are using that shape. So instead of, doing, instead of using the shape, um, shape fighter, we'll say Doctor One. We, should, we could have nam named it something else. Or you could just say Shape Doctor, which is another one that was previously added to the model. Okay, so that's one thing we can do. We just give them a different shape. And you'll notice their speed. Their speed is, is not suggestive of uh, the speed of medical practitioners, but rather of fighter jets. It's the speed of 1,000. So I'd like to change it to a speed of 10, which has more modest implications. Um, uh, and so we've just modified doctors to, to lend them a more stately pace, okay? Um, so you can go now run this model, and um, neither of those are absolutely essential. I just thought that would, it, it, now you can see the doctor. See the doctor moving there? See, see this doctor? And they're going down, and they, they've been sent to storage, so they retrieve the scope, and now they go down to the, to the patient, because it's, see the send to patient? Mm -hmm. And they're going up to retrieve the patient, and, and then they attach to the patient, and they move to procedure room. Mm -hmm. Do you see that? Okay, they're moving down here to the procedure room. And, and this actually counts up. See these counts? It tells you the number that are in this state or have come in or have left. Okay, this patient has is, is finished their procedure, they detach, and this doctor is bringing back the scope and returning the scope. It's going to release it, and, and then the patient's going to move to the exit and leave. Okay? Um, so you could start to see some, how some of that logic uh, plays out. Here, send to storage sends the doctor to an already seized unit called scope. Send to patient then sends the doctor and a scope. They can move together because the doctor is is uh, associated with the um, with the scope. Um, so so they move move together and they move to the entity. Okay. Um, so um, send to patient. They move to the entity. Um, and and then then they're going to move to the entity and then attaches the entity physically. So they they'll travel with the entity. Note that this attachment occurs after the resources are in proximity to. In other words, they've reached, reached the, um, the entity. And it seizes all non-static resources at the entity location. Um, so any, anything that can travel. And then they send the agent 
to the procedure room, to the seized resource unit procedure room. And because resources are attached, this move to will move both the entity and also bring the moving and portable resources along, the doctor and the scope. Okay? And then they go through the procedure, and the procedure takes a certain amount of time as drawn from this distribution, and then they detach. So they detaches from all resources, returns the scope, so the resources to send are the doctor and the scope, and it sends them back to the entity. Note that these are defined kind of from the perspective of the entity. So in other words, the resources to send are the doctor and scope associated with it, and its destination is given by a node called storage room, which happens to be the, 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 the room, the home, home node associated with the scope. And then once it gets to the storage room, um, uh, so um, uh, it releases all seized resources and the moving resources move back to their home location, okay? And, um, and then um, you'll notice, so, so that's the logical flow of this sort of thing. And you'll notice that you can build these sort of flow charts quite flexibly using this palette, which is located over on the um, the left side of your um, of your um, your screen, so from this enterprise library, you can put in more things. You can put in splits. This is a teaching example, so it's it's particularly um, stylized and, and, and simplistic in its depiction, but it gets you thinking about how resources are associated with people are they're attached to people and um, and how you deal with detaching and resources going back to their home locations, et cetera. So Dylan, yeah. No? Um, well, okay. So, so maybe I'll, I'll make some comments. So the question was, didn't really understand this distinct, distinction between network, uh, network enter, network seize, and send to storage. Oh, okay. Yeah. Right. So, so network enter associates them logically with this network which has these resources. So it makes those resources available to them in subsequent steps um, until they, they leave that network. And then network sees, um, and that's instantaneous. There's no movement involved in it. Um, and then network sees, um, associates them with, with all three of these, and it won't move until it has all three, okay? And now, now we're cooking with gas, and, and now we can go move around. Notice in Network Enter, they appear in the waiting hall, okay? So, I mean, I, I've tried to draw a, a distinction here between logically what's going on on the one hand and, and visually, and it turns out that this all has a visual representation too. But they appear at that waiting hall and they just, in terms of semantics, they're waiting in that waiting hall until all three of these are available, the doctor, the room, and the scope. And it's only then that the doctor goes and, and retrieves the scope and, um, and makes, and they wends their way to the actual patient, okay? And then the doctor attach, and the scope attached to the patient, and then they move, move to this procedure room which is, when it says procrum, it's the one implicitly associated with this entity, okay? And they get operated upon, and then it detaches them, and they can go back to their home node, and then the entity is released to, to, uh, to leave. Yeah, okay. So, so let's go down to doctor. Um, so if we go down to doctor, it's a very good question. You notice it, it says it's moving, right? It's um, a capacity of five, et cetera. And it says it's speed. But um, you'll notice down towards the bottom it says home node. Okay. Uh, home nodes. Now, and you'll notice also the scope. If you click on the scope resource, that too has a home node, the storage room. So the doctors are in the staff room. Um, the, 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 homes, the, the scope, is its home is the storage room. Now, the, the plot thickens a little bit when you talk about the, proc, or the, the, the procedure rooms because they're defined not by a home. I'll distinguish this from those two. 
Um, the, the doctors in the, the scopes live in a single node. See, it says home defined by single node here. Um, whereas the proc room is defined by a path across nodes. So see this path over here? That actually defines a set of resources. So these are three rooms associated with, with that resource. And there's a kink in the middle, so it marks this one as well. Basically, these where it begins, ends, and where kinks are. It um, it knows that those are a marker of a of the visual the visual resources associated with it. Okay, so so um, capacity is defined by a home shape. So if we had another kink in it in a different room in a different rectangle, it would be associated with it. Um, exactly, a kink in yeah. Exactly. Um, okay, so there's a visual depiction accompanying this logical flow that we're starting to get into. We've dealt with the sort of logic of it. Now, entities are associated with icons. What, with what icons are entities associated with? Um, well, uh, we can, um, I think it's, it's, it's depicted right up at this uh, source. Um, uh, if we go up, you notice it says entity animation shape. You, I make it half you know, with chance 50%, it's a patient. Otherwise, it's a shape patient. So there's some actual variation there. Um, resources are associated with locations and icons. We just saw that. We actually changed ours back from a fighter jet to a more sedate representation. And then locations, they're further associated with, we just saw that. They're associated with a node as marked, as specified, explicitly as delineated by a path. Movement networks are associated with routing paths, okay? so. Um, uh, if we go to look at the network, click on network, it's associated with what's called a network group, which is located over, if you were to go expand this, um, the network group is under like main phase three. It, it has this network group here and it's a set of polylines. And these allow it to route people between different locations automatically. So any logic figures out how to route someone from this location to that location along these, these resources. And this says, essentially says the resources associated with this network, okay? Um, and specified by this network group, these set of visual resources. Um, and, uh, and then the presentation, the entity, we said it's set by the source. Um, presentation of resources is, is set by the idle and, and busy um, representation. And then, um, Network enter, it specifies the speed to use for patients, and it specifies where they appear in the logical network with which they're associated, as we saw. Okay? Um, and then you notice these polylines, those are the elements over which the agents move, the entities move, excuse me, um, entities and resources move. So they follow these, these polylines, okay? Um, and you can stretch them as you see fit. And, um, you know, here, if, if we're in, in this model, watch this. If I'm in main phase three, I can put a, a further kink in this room, uh, in this. So, so if we if we watch this right now, and we watch how people go to this last room, watch this. Um, I'll, I'll speed this up a bit, but watch watch how. Okay, so they basically kind of go with this. They kind of are traveling along here, right? And that's not no accident. It's occurring because this line here. Now, if I double clicked here, oops. Oh man, I have to ungroup this, I guess. Maybe, maybe I'm not gonna do this. Um, I would have to ungroup it and, um, and regroup it. Um, well, okay, excuse me. No, no, maybe in phase three, I can go to presentations and then uh, I can go to network group. Um, and then I could go to, um, I, don't, I don't know what this is, is called. It's poly one of these polylines. This guy maybe? No, that's that, that one, that one, that one. That one, that one, or this one? No? Oh, probably this one. Okay, can I double click on this? Yes. And then I could drag it like way out here, right? What do you think they're gonna do now when they travel? They're gonna they're gonna take a circuitous route. Um so so watch this. Boom. Um Okay, um so so we'll speed this up. Okay, there's the first two. Okay, see that? They, w they went up and they, 
they kind of uh, travel around. So those those lines are describing their routes of flow. Now, what's kind of nice here, uh, so by the way, uh, an important point I don't want you to miss. Ladies and gentlemen, the time taken from someone to go from, for a patient to be processed here is an emergent property. Look at that. They, they ran out of, um, ran out of uh, the capacity of the waiting room. Um, so they were building up there. Why were they building up there? Well, in part is because the, doc the speed of doctors was so much lower. Um, and in part it was because we had the doctors here going on the circuitous route. So the time required to treat a patient here, ladies and gentlemen, is the emergent property of their physical path that they take, as well as of these other things like how long the procedure takes. So suppose we were to transform doctors back into fighter jets, well, or to, or to speed, lend them the speed of fighter jets. Um, uh, so let's give doctors down here in the lower left, um, let's perform an intervention and have them travel at a speed of, of a thousand again. Okay. Is their speed a function of how many people are in the waiting room? That's, a, to how many that's an interesting question. I believe this is a Java expression, so um, we, um, yeah, so, so here it is, you know, self.speed equals whatever expression is in there. So you could have it. Uh, you could have it based on a, a function that's called and, and have that function return something based on how many people are in the waiting room. Yeah. That, that's right, that's right. So let's give it a speed of 1,000, and now let's run it. Um, and uh, if you were to run it now, I think what you'd find is um, that they, um, oh, oh, no, 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 it's still not enough to, to deal with them quick. You'd have to speed up patience, maybe. Um, what, what's that? Uh, the patients, that's true. They're limited by the patients. That's, true, that's a very, very good. How would we speed up patients? I'm talking in the model, not in reality. <laughs> 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 well, you could go to source here. Uh, sorry, no, it's network enter. Excuse me. Network enter. Um, scroll down. Oh, oh, uh, uh, speed. This dot gets. Oh, that's interesting. Um, so it's it's based on a function um, this dot get speed um, and uh, here's get speed and um, and this this says oh get speed was called at that time so this is just a hack to have it report when it's when it's actually calling it um, and so I could have the patients now move at a hundred sp speed a hundred let's see if that speeds it up or the question is does the procedure have to be speeded up right um, uh, obviously, you could also change the layout of the place, right? And that's exactly what this sort of what this sort of uh, modeling can do. So, ladies and gentlemen, I want to make the very important observation again, and forgive me for repeating it if it's obvious to you. But because the throughput of patients here, how many patients we can serve per unit time, is an emergent property of the interaction of all these things, not just of and procedures and, and but it's also a reflection of how many patients are in line for these scopes, how many resources are available, right? Um, how what the paths are. This is a very good vehicle for understanding as you add resources, which will therefore reduce some of the queues potentially. Would that make a difference in reducing the patient um, you know back backlogs? Uh, to what degree the paths travel? So if you could locate resources like the storage room closer, how much would that increase throughput? Um, to what degree could you, you know, speed up um, the uh, the sort of processing of patients early on in terms of uh, having multiple receptionists or what have you? These things could all be investigated quite readily um, using this framework, and the throughput of patients could be would be an emergent property of those. Uh, uh, of those underlying assumptions, which could be tweaked in different scenarios. So this is just a scenario like any other. So again, modeling at an individual level, but process-centric with, with resources, with explicit spatial time recorded, you know, or, or taken, um, with the opportunity for entities or doctors or the, the, the system as a whole to record the statistics, on how long things take, what fraction of the time a certain resource is being used, how long on average it takes for a patient to go from here to here, 
the average amount of time in the system or the average amount of, of time a given doctor is available or what have you. And, and you can use this to, um, to examine um, the impact of, of, of uh, decisions on, on patient flow. Um, so I've done this in a brutally short sort of way. I apologize uh, uh, about this, but um, you'll find quite a lot of additional detail in my online lectures and, and on these, uh, these slides. I've tried to highlight some of the subtleties when you first encounter this model um, that you have to really puzzle out. Um, I've tried to sort of point out where some things are. Um, okay, and, and I, I step through sort of different phases of these models, and I would encourage you to think about the tutorial if you're really interested to learn how you build up a model like this, okay? Um, and uh, you'll see that this particular model uh, recommends itself for that because it has three different phases with successively more sophisticated uh, processing. So this first phase doesn't even have any resources. People just flow through and are treated, et cetera. They do move around, okay? Um, and I talk about dealing with the capacity issues and releasing the room. Okay, um, I apologize for the brutally short uh, exposure to this. It raises a lot of potential when it comes to health services investigations, among other things. And once again, it's something that can be merged with in hybrid models, um, this with, with some of the other methodologies like system dynamics and interface modeling very readily. Okay? So um, those are all the comments I have right now. We're scheduled to go to, um, to lunch early today. And uh, Jeff has kindly offered to, to talk with us about some of the uh, related the modeling related to dementia um, that that um, he's done, and which which triggered um, 